Um, okay, so as I said to a few guys in Seder, um, I am in um, slight disbelief that Rosh Chodesh Adar is Friday Shabbos. Um, you know. Are we doing what? Oh, for sure. I don't know what. That's not my department, but yes, we definitely are. Do we have off on Purim? We have Erev Purim, like Tiny Esther. Oh, I doubt it. Probably the second half of the day when you're fasting. Probably a shortened day because the fast. Yeah. So I. But, right. Yeah. Exactly. Anyways. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm in a little bit of shock. It, this year, you know, time doesn't work normally this, this year. Um, you know, we, we were going for a walk on Shabbos. There were like kids I happened to have not seen in months. And like, wow, like you tripled in size, you know, I was like, um, so yeah. So it's almost Parshat Shkalim. So I figured I would talk about a, a very light Sugi here in Baba Basra that may or may not be related to Machta Shekel. In fact, that is the Lumjish, that is the, the way to get into the central questions here is, is this or not, is this or is it not the same sugya as Machter HaShekel? Um, and then, you know, when we finish whatever is here, we will talk just directly with Machter HaShekel, which is not directly Baba Basra, but, you know, it is this week, so I'm, I'm taking some liberty um, with it. I know, I know Rishmul David, I think already this week is starting on doing like perm sugyas for a few weeks. Um, for now, we'll say that I'm being Yotze for a little bit, and we'll see whether we do a perm sugya you know, maybe not next week. We'll see. Um, so the way I want to get into this is a one line in um, one line in Baba Basra Daftet as to the minimum amount of staka you can get away with uh, per year, um, which the only other time we know of a minimum is obviously Machtera uh, Shekel. And the question is, what are is there any relationship between these two, or are they really two completely? Uh, different sugyot, which we have to understand uh, separately. Okay, and then through that question, we'll be able to get into the question of what exactly is the nature of the mitzvah of Machta Shekha. But let's start with the local, with the local sugya. And if you forgot, I put here in brackets. Remember, this week is Parshat Shkalim. Okay, this week is Shkalim. Next week is Zachar. Purim is in two weeks from Friday. Okay. Ah, ah yes, two weeks. Two weeks from Friday is Purim. Per Meshulash, no less. You know, so, uh, you know, that, that craziness. Um, yeah, so the Gemara says, what is the minimum? How much stock do you have to give minimum per year? What does the Gemara say? Shlishit HaShekel. Amar of Asi Olam al Adam Atzmo Milatet Shlishit HaShekel Bishana. You should never give less. Don't hold yourself back from giving less than a third of a shekel per year. You already have questions. Amazing. Yes, Ezra. Uh, is there any place tomorrow where it's about uh, how big a shekel is? Yeah. I mean, yes, but translating into modern money, this is not very much money, right? I mean, it was a type of currency. So, you know, nowadays, you know, a shekel is like, I don't know, because the, the, look, there are some post game who err on really taking it as a weight of silver, which I don't know, it's maybe twenty something dollars is a shekel, not not much if you just go by weight. Other people try to figure out what shekel what symbolized in the Gemara, which is more like a certain amount of uh you know, they they, they, they try to figure out more in percentages of the average salary, right? And there are enough communities for this for a lot of things, for like mach so you get this for Pidgin Haben, right? They start taking it out, and they, then in, more there, it does seem to be more by weight, but when it comes to, like, Suba, and they try to figure out how much the money being figured out there is, they, some people want to be more machmir and try, you know, it gets, gets interesting. Um, but it's not that much money. We're not talking a lot of money. And, again, you, have, you can look at the weight of silver and figure out what it would be today. I'm sure it's, sure it's not so much. And a third of a shekel, anyways. It's, you're really not talking so much money. What's the source? So the source is a book in Tanakh, which I'm going to pretend that all of you have learned. Um, how many of you have ever learned, say, for Ezra and Nehemiah? What we call Ezra and Nehemiah, it's really one big book. 
What? Oh, God, look at that. Amazing. See, I was, I was proved right. Someone had read it at some point in their life. He thinks. He's not sure, but he thinks. You had a summary of it. Okay, I'm not going to count that. Fine. But Ezra and I, What? Oh, you had to give a summary. Oh, I will count that. That's great. That means you have to process it at some point. That's good. So, thanks. Yeah, yeah, very good. So Ezra Nehemia, really, in Tanakh, halachically, is one book, discusses Shizat Zion, right, the return to Israel after the, uh, for the, towards the beginning of the, right, the beginning of the, the beginning of the, beta, the second bit of Megdash, that period. Um, and uh, Ezra is a spiritual leader, Nehemia is a political powerhouse who's getting things uh, moving in terms of rebuilding the walls of Yerushalayim and the bit of Megdash. So there he demands a minimum of a ma'adnu aleinu mitzvat latin aleinu shlishida shekel bashanal avodat beit elokeinu. As part of that, he established mitzvot to charge themselves yearly for a third of a shekel in the building of, uh, for, for the service in the Beit HaMikdash. Now, if you weren't forced to ask how is this related to Machta shekel before, the fact that the Gemara derives it from a pasuk that is talking about supporting the Beit HaMikdash, right, forces you to ask this even more pointedly. Um, but before we get to that question, Toshua had an even simpler question, which is, wait a second, I don't understand. The Gemara is trying to figure out the minimum that you have to pay to Tzedakah every year, so why is it pulling something from the Beit HaMikdash? Right? Are in these different categories, right? We have seen several times throughout this year that despite, in common parlance, people not knowing the difference between different types of staka and calling everything staka, whether it's to poor people or donations to yeshivas or donations to, uh, you know, to whatever, right? Those are not the same thing. We've talked about this painfully, a painful number of times that you have to draw distinctions. The generic catch-all of staka doesn't really catch, capture the halachic distinctions. So, so yeah, maybe nowadays someone would say, Staka, give to the shul, even though, I mean, sure, maybe for the minog of, my, of Maser Ksafim, which we assume is a minog according to most postgame, so there, shuls and schools and all that, that counts. But classically, that's not what Staka was referring to. Staka was talking about money to the poor, and p- giving money to the Beit HaMikdash and to shuls and schools, those are important, but it's not this. So Tosa's asked, and I don't understand. How did we derive from the Beis HaMikdash this Chiyuv? So, just from, before we even get to Tosa's answer, tell me, what possible directions could you take to deal with Tosa's problem? What? Louder. Well, you could say our Gemara isn't really talking about Staka. That seems to be weird because it sounds like Staka, but okay. Right? I mean, all the surrounding figures were about Staka, but okay. But, uh, you're right. You could, you're right. You could say that it's Milate, right? You're right. So right, one way, one direction would be to say maybe it's not about staka per se, right? It's about giving, and therefore we're more generic, right? Or you could say it is about staka, but there's a certain reason conceptually why you could learn it from the Veda Megdash, even though they're distinct, right? Meaning you can conflate, right? Meaning you could conflate them and say it's about giving, and therefore there is no difference. You could say, no, staka is one thing, Veda Megdash is another, and they remain different. But nevertheless, there's enough of a common denominator that we could derive one from the other, right? Or you could conflate in the opposite direction, right? Which is, right, push it back towards Mikdash, right? Um, so we'll see, right? Meaning, 
conflating, right, could mean bringing Mikdash closer to Saka or Saka closer to Mikdash, right? Um, or saying they all belong to some broader category, right? Or you could say, no, they remain distinct, and nevertheless, there are certain quantitative similarities, right, that we can compare, and that's, and that's, uh, and that's fine. Okay, but Tosas asks, or implies, that he asked. He didn't actually ask this explicitly, it implies. The Afal Gav the Haikra Gabe Bet Elokenuktiv, even though it's about the Ben Megdash, meaning the implied question is, how can you derive it from the Ben Megdash? That was the implied question. So he says, even though it's from the Ben Megdash, what does he say? The Hainu Bedek Abayit, i.e., what's Bedek Abayit? Yeah, general maintenance of the Benedict Dash. Calls again, Staka. Okay. Someone want to unpack that deceptively simple test was for me? Yeah. Good. So that's what Tosin says. That if you have to give a third for the upkeep of the Benedict Dash, then you definitely have to give to Staka. So, okay. So, first conceptual point. Does Tosa think that donating to Staka and donating to the Beit HaMikdash are conceptually the same? Are they the same? No, they're not. Right, they're not. Because whenever you say Kol Shikane, what he means is these are different categories, right? But for one reason or other, you can derive. They're comparable but not identical, right? And they're all the same category, but they can be compared. If a third of a shekel is what you have to give to the Beta Magdash? Coach against Staka. Good. Now why? Someone unpack that for me. Why? Why would that be true? Because it literally gives you no hints whatsoever. So I don't know if there's a wrong answer. But someone unpack this does this for me, because I don't really know if I can't, right? I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. But he definitely thinks they're distinct. Staka is one thing. Beta Magdash is a different thing. But... Yeah, right. So I think that might be what he's getting at, which is, look, upkeep of the Beit HaMikdash, as important as it is, like, yeah, like organizations, if you don't give, someone else will give, and like, they'll figure it out, they'll find a wealthy donor, they'll, you know, whatever. If you don't give, it's okay, right? Like, organizations are a bit more malleable, or a bit more... You know, I don't know if I want to say Ben Magdash is less important, but okay. The Gemara definitely has its moments where it's, yeah, okay. The, the Gemara, right, well, Tosit really quotes this Midrash, right, that we, um, building on the comments of the Gemara, so I'll just blow them all together. But yes, Andrew might be right, that the Gemara says, Mizmor la Asaf, the Gemara says, what, my Mizmor la Asaf, kina la Asaf mi baile. Asaf is singing about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, so why would you sing in this particular capital that it's referring to? So why Mizmor? Kinala Asaf. So the Gemara says, no, in the end of the day, the fact that God took out his wrath, I'll eat some vavanim, on the sticks and stones of Beit HaMikdash, is better than taking out of the Jewish people. So Andrew just said, look, maybe you just say human life is more important than Beit HaMikdash. Or you say organizations have ways of getting money that human beings don't. Or there are direct obligations to give staka in a way that there aren't, maybe to support the Beit HaMikdash, which is more gen general. It's about building the Beit HaMikdash, maybe not upkeep. I don't know. Come up with any of those. If you have to, if despite all of that, Nehemia said that every year, every person must contribute at least a shlishit of a shekel, that minimal amount towards the Beit HaMikdash, then staka, which is more important or more personal, right, or more, right, individually funded, or however you want to take it, at least, at least, at least, you should eke out the few dollars that is encompassed in in, in Shlishida Shekel for staka. Okay? Right? So Tosin said something like that. Which of those he means, I have no idea. He doesn't give you any more hints than what I just said. Okay? So what we're left with is that, according to Tosvos, Shlishit Ashekel, 
of Beit HaMikdash is conceptually different from Staka, and this is a Kalva Homer. It's if you have to personally contribute to the Beit HaMikdash, the upkeep of the Beit HaMikdash, a third of a shekel here, you do have to, you have to for Staka as well, but they're not the same. They're just, you compare the categories, right? Because Staka is more important in the ways that we talked about, but they're different. Okay, according to the Tosmat, is this, does this sugya have anything in any way, shape, or form to do with Mashtad Shekel? No, presumably not at all, right? Meaning, this is really a sugya just about Staka, and like, we derive from a Kalva Chomer, from a Takana of Nehemia, the minimum amount. But like, the Masla Shekel and that minimum, whatever that is, that's something else, that has nothing to do with this. This is a mitzvah staka, and the fact that we compare it to the Beit HaMikdash is accidental here. But staka remains conceptually distinct from Mikdash, and therefore, this is just a staka sugya, and the Mikdash is accidental, it's incidental to the discussion. Fine. That's Tosos. Rabbeinu Gershom. Rabbeinu Gershom, remind me who Rabbeinu Gershom is. Yeah, that person, right? Rabbi Gershom Mora Gola, right? Towards the end of the Golnik period, um, the beginning of the Ashkenazi period, right? His, the, the Beit Midrash, Rabbi Gershom Mora Gola, is the predecessor to Rashi, right? Rashi learns there in Mainz. And then, um, right, as you see, they have a, basically a Rashi like commentary. Rashi sort of creates the pinnacle of that Beit Midrash in his commentary. But this is Rabbi Gershom Mora Gola. Mishlish Shekel Bitstaka. La'avodat elokeinu hainut staka. Okay? That's what he says. A third of a shekel for staka to the Beit HaMikdash, i.e. staka. Okay. Someone want to explain Rabbi Nagershom there? Yeah, go ahead. Good. So, 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 Tosvo does not conflate, does not combine categories. He just says they are similar enough that I can compare them on a Kalva Homer basis. Rabbeinu Gershom collapses this into tzaka, right? And seems to say, seems to say, look, what we derive from this is that tzaka, maybe in the modern way that we use tzaka, you know, charity to anything that you get a tax write-off for, right? I, I, I will be honest, in brackets here, I do wonder how much of the way we think about staka is subconsciously affected by the notion of like a tax write offable charitable donation, right? Because we have this idea that like if the government writes it off, so that's like staka. But the irony is that I think there are people who feel like real staka is giving to organization and like giving a dollar to the staka box or to the poor person who asked you, that's like fake tzaka, right? Because you don't get a tax write-off, right? That's obviously wrong. That's like the classic tzaka, is when you give to a poor person. An organizational tzaka is like a borrowed term, except maybe giving to like a soup kitchen, in which case it's not a borrowed term. It, 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 it's just indirect. In Toronto, they have this way of dealing with the, the, this problem, and that is, they, uh, it's called the Zichron Binyamin, where basically there's a, a parent organization that instead of giving poor people like dollars, you give like, let's say you buy 500 coupons from the organization that gives you a tax write off for $500, and then you give the poor person the coupon that they then have to go to the organization to redeem for money. So it accomplishes two things. One is you get a tax write-off, right? And the other is that you don't have to check in whether the, the, the poor person is, is legit because they have to redeem these coupons at the organization. So they collect however many from different people and then the organization checks them out before they let them redeem it for cash. Um, but I, but the Rabbeinu Gershom seems to, at least for the purposes of this surgeon, now I can't say that in general, Rabbeinu Gershom thinks that all charitable donations are equal. But it's clear that at least for these purposes, 
he seems to think that the minimum that you have to give per year is, you know, to stuck out broadly speaking, right? That, that when we talk about this minimum, it doesn't mean like what we normally think of stuck of a poor person. It means like charitable donations. You need to give every year a minimum. And therefore, you know, to the bit of McDash, to Saka, to poor people, whatever. Now, this is sort of weird, right? Because this is, in many ways, the opposite of what Andrew said. Right? Andrew said that Tosos Kalvachomer, culture gain, seems to imply that there is something unique, important, special, sui generis, about giving money to an actual poor person. And therefore, everything else, if you have to give a third of a shekel to the Beit HaMikdash, you definitely have to give that to a poor person, because that's the paradigm of charity, is actually giving to a human being who needs it, not an institution, even if that institution is the Beit HaMikdash. Right? That's, that's sort of the ethos behind Andrew's intuition of how you understand the Kalva Chomer, the Kol Shikain of Tosvot. Rabbi Gershom, in order to solve the problem of how do I derive charitable giving to a poor person from institutional giving of the Beit HaMikdash, takes the exact opposite, and I honestly think slightly problematic, modern ethos, which is, you know, charity is charity is charity, and who cares if I give it to the... Who cares if I give it to a poor person or to a shul or a school or the Metropolitan Museum of Art or, uh, you know, I, I, I doubt Rabbi Gershom would go that far. I assume there would be a, a place at which he would draw it. But at some level, it, it, it's a very, right, it's a, it's a strange notion, which is that charitable giving is about giving rather than caring per se about who gets the result, giving is giving, right? Giving is giving. Now, I, I, I don't, you know, it seems to be that he thinks that for these purposes, you could be Yotze, your third of a shekel, even not giving it to a poor person, because he says, la vodat elokenu dahainu tzaka. There's an equivalence, right? That what you learn from Nehemiah is that everybody should be a giving person. Now, I could slightly help Rabbeinu Gershom here by claiming that Rabbeinu, what Rabbeinu Gershom learns from here is um, that the focus of this sugya is, and we've talked about this a lot in Saka. You know what? I'll, 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 I'll put, I'll, we've talked about this a lot in Saka. Andrew, whether he likes it or not, or realized it or not, was making a type of a consequentialist argument, which is what we care here is about results, and the result of a poor person getting money is more important than the money going to the Beit HaMikdash. To blur the lines, you can focus on a virtue side, which is maybe what the Gemara is saying is that, look, we know that according to the Torah, when do you have to give staka to a poor person? One second. When do you have to give staka to a poor person? What? When he asks. Very good. Because the Torah frames it in the negative. Is if a person asks you, so lo ta'amek, lo tikbos, don't close your hand and don't close your heart to the poor person. You have to give to the poor person, poor, poor person when he asks. Right? That's what generates the chiyuv. Right? But the Gemara is saying, never give less than a third. Now, what does that imply? Even if nobody asks you, you have to give. So you could argue that, look, obviously poor people are important and you have to give to them. But let's say you happen to live in a fabulously wealthy society where literally everybody in a thousand mile radius is halakhically not poor, right? Not, I'm not talking about inequality. I'm talking about nobody will have wants of food, clothing, shelter, basics of life, at all, okay? So nobody's going to ask you for money. So you might think, well, 
We've solved it. We've solved global poverty. Consequentially, in terms of consequences, the world is great, right? Or go farther, the whole world. Nobody is starving anywhere on the face of planet Earth. There's nobody. There are no more charities for malaria nets, right? There's not a, nothing, right? Everyone, everything is great. So you might think from a consequentialist perspective, okay, there's no, no need to get stuck anymore. So maybe what Amina Gershom is getting at is, but you have to give. Giving is good for you. And what Nehemia did was say, you should give a minimum of a third. From that vantage point, I could see conflating them, right? Which is saying, look, Rabbeinu Gershom isn't denying, Rabbeinu Gershom isn't saying that realistically the average Jewish person, well, I, I see your hand, let me just get through my thought, Ellie. What I would want to say for Rabbeinu Gershom is that Rabbeinu Gershom isn't saying that the average Jewish person can get away with not giving money to a poor person in a year. What he's saying is, if for some bizarre reason, no poor person ever comes to you, because that generates its own chiyuf, which is to help him, but maybe you live in, in, a, in a utopian world where there is no starvation and no illness and no nothing and no one needs money. So from a consequentialist perspective, a utilitarian perspective, there is no need to donate. Still, giving is important. And when you're focusing on the act of giving, because it's important to you, it's important that you be a giving person if there are literally no poor people in the world, so then maybe we can talk more generically about staka. And what Nehemia told you is that that minimum act of giving can be expressed through a third of a shekel. So maybe, maybe, maybe that's what Amanda Gershom wants for my life, right? Because clearly, I think in the terms of results, staka to a poor person is different from staka to an organization, even the Beit Hamikdash. What? I mean, they're different, right? Meaning the classic staka, right? It's clear that the classic staka in the Torah is not organizational, even the bit of Mikdash. Correct. So then you'd have to come up with it and you'd have to say that, uh, you know, what, you know, that's why I'm trying to sort of eke out an understanding. Like, why would Rabbeinu Gershom give up on what is so true in the rest of the Torah, which is that formally staka refers to paying money to poor people. And, Supporting the Beit HaMikdash is something different. Supporting Talmud Torah is something different. They're all important, right? And by Meister Ksafim, we may let you give it to all of them because it's a minug, right? But Staka classically is poor person. So how could he just say, yeah, Beit HaMikdash, Staka, all the same thing, right? So he could just say, yeah, giving is giving. Maybe that's what he believes. I find that weird, right? But it could be that what he's saying is, no, maybe you're right in terms of results. They're different, and if a poor person asks you, you have to give him. What our Gemara is saying is that if there is literally nobody to give to, so then it's just about the act of giving, so maybe, maybe, maybe you can conflate them. Now, we're going to see that that's not really the case that most people talk about. What's the case, the classic case where people care about the minimum of a third of a shekel? is a poor person giving it. Is that everybody has to give a minimum, even if they themselves are poor, and by, but that logic points in this direction. It's saying, look, from a consequentialist perspective, it makes no sense for you to give, because the money's coming back to you, you get more stuck in than you give. But from a virtue perspective, or a deontological perspective, where we care about who you are and what you do, then we're saying, bracketing the consequentialist part of it, every person must participate in the act of giving at least once a year. And maybe, maybe Rabbi Gershom is saying in that world, the distinctions of what you're giving to are less important, right? Because it's about what it does to you or what you, about doing the right act. So there we can collect them. But obviously in terms of results, if there's a poor person starving, you have to give a lot more than a third of a shekel. We're saying that when there is no consequentialist aspect to it, and it's just about the act of giving, so fine, a third of a shekel makes sense. Ellie, yeah. Gavi, you want to just open this a little bit more? Because the rest of you are not blocked by glass, but he is blocked by glass. One more time and yell it, yeah.
for is that again for it to be uh, for it to be virgin uh, not necessarily meaning it, look the Rambam right for example the Rambam right well, how does the Rambam view virtue ethics right the Rambam views virtue ethics as as I do virtuous acts so that eventually they become natural and I become a virtuous person. Right. Yeah, habit forming. Right? That for him, for the Rambam, the way we imagine virtue ethics is not that you only do things as an expression of virtue, is that you do things to get to the point where you become virtuous and it will be an expression of virtue. Right? The Chinuch says the same thing, right? Right? That the point of mitzvot is that the heart follows the actions. So you're right. This is not necessarily an expression of virtue. It might be a cultivation of virtue. Yes, that that I think you're right. Right? That the Rambam's virtue ethics is about cultivation, right? Not just about result of having virtue. It's mitzvah. The purpose of mitzvah is to cultivate virtue, which means do that act even if you don't feel it yet, right? Do it until you do feel it. Yes, Ezra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, so again, not necessarily because in halacha we really do believe that we can force you to engage in certain actions to generate. You're right, you're right. It, it could, you know, you could say, well, it's hard, I meaning doesn't it sound like doesn't this sound very consequentialist? It's Nehemiah raising a yearly tax, right? Yeah, that less virtue. I agree with you. You're right. Would you say that because the source for it is a like, formal tax, that would mean that if you pay taxes, you're going to be a virtuous person? Because the welfare and charity... So that's a big modern question, which is what, how do you view... Because it's, uh, like, no, I understand. The source for it is... No, I understand. And there's a big question in modern postgame of whether... The fact that percentages of your taxes go to social welfare, which is arguably, right, stuck does that affect the cheshbon? Most folks in the end don't want to do that because, you know, they want you to give more. You know, they think you should be giving stuck uh, And they think in the end of the day you're paying taxes. Like, well, no, look, the, part of the logic is simply that, look, you pay whatever taxes you do. If the government decided to give it to poor people, it would, but if it decided to give it to museums, it would do that. Or if it decided to line their pockets, they would do that. Or at the end of the day, you pay taxes because you have to pay taxes. But if you really do the math and figure out that whatever... No, I understand, but their, their, their logic is that taxes, at the end of the day, you pay because they're taxes. Right, the same thing. The taxes of the county, at the end of the day, you pay because they're taxes. Uh, sort of. You, it was a direct collection for the Beta Magdash. It wasn't generic tax. Right. It was towards the lofty goal directly, rather than I pay taxes, I pay taxes, and I hope it goes to good goals. There, there still is a distinction. You're not, you're not. It's not a crazy question. You're right. There are post who, who legitimately bring this up, right? And did they pay Gabe Saka? I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I, I have no idea. So again, we tend to be pretty loose on this in terms of Meister, just because Meister is a minog, according to Bach. But in terms of your minimum of staka, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know. You know, so there's a... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, okay. Um... The, Mar the Marsha... Is similar to Tosos, though not identical. The Marsha, what does the Marsha say? The Marsha says, Al Yimna Atmo Mishlita Shekel, Af Al Gav Dile Inyan Karbanot, by Chati Shekel Bechal Shana. Right, so he's about as clear as you can. He said, Look, there is a yearly obligation for Karbanot, and what's that called? Machsed Shekel, the half Shekel. This is not that. Hacha did staka dam yot tve likdushat bedek habayit to have a dushat dam in visagi bishlit hashekel. So this is quite the fancy little move. But what does he say? He says, look, 
fundamentally, he's very similar to Tosfos, which is Beit HaMikdash is different from Staka. But how do we derive a third of a shekel? It's not because we conflate the categories. What do we do? We leave them distinct. But we try to figure out what the minimum amount of Staka should be by finding a similar category. And he says we have two models which are existent. What are they? Machzer shekel two carbonot, and the shlish of the shekel that Nehemiah instituted for the upkeep of the Ben Amikdash. And he said, well, it's basically, you know, we try to find the one that is more similar to, to try to figure out a minimum. And he said, well, what is the minimum? Well, carbonot, the machzer shekel goes to carbonot, that third of a shekel goes to the treasury, the Beit HaMikdash. Staka is more about money than it is about like Kapara or Kedusha or whatever the Karbanot are about. So like we borrow the minimum amount from Kedusha, Bedaka buy it from the treasury, which is sort of similar to Staka. Okay? So more or less, the Marsha is saying something similar to Tosfot without the Kalva Homer. Right? He doesn't have a Kalva Homer. He just thinks... It's not a Kalva Homer, it's like a borrowing. It's like we find a different place where you're obligated to give money to something, we find the minimum amount and we sort of borrow it by analogy, right? So again, like Tosro, he thinks they remain di similar. But unlike Tosro, there's no Kalva Homer here. Yes, Yaakov. Correct, and this is the the minimum, 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 minimum. No, no, no. Remember, if someone asks you for tzaka, you're obligated to give them, right? Because of lotik votes and lotamek. This is the minimum when you aren't. This is the minimum intrinsically, right? Again, that's the key: is that if poor people are asking you, you can't get away with this because you would violate a law to love him. If you said no, it's if nobody asks you, because nobody needs, what's the minimum that you need to give simply because you need to give, that's this. But you're right, if people have needs, so then you have to fund them anyways, because of the other Yisurim, right? And the other Chiyuvim that we talked about. But this is the minimum of giving when nobody needs, when nobody asks, when nobody anything. And then he says, so we borrow from, you know, whatever. Okay, one more person who's more or less in this camp is the Bach. So, someone remind me who is the Bach? Rabbi Yoel Circus. Circus. S-I-R-K-E-S. -E right, Circus. I'm sure that's how he spelled it, because, you know, he spoke English. Right? In Poland. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi Yoel Circus. Um in the 16th century, writing his commentary on the tour. He writes, Lishna de la Olam hachi perusha. What does la Olam mean? What does it mean always? Af al pi dai kra gave beit elokeinu ktiv. Even though this pasuk is in the context of the beit hamikdash. Dai nu beit agabai i.e. the treasury. Va'ach shava bayit chorev. And he said, he says, why does nobody ask the obvious question? Not only is this comparing apples to oranges, but the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. So how do you know that Nehemiah's Takana means anything now that the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed? That's a fair question, no? So he says, Afilu hachi le'olam. That's why it says forever. Afshilo b'fnei abayit al yimna. V'atos v'atkazu didstaka yalfinan l'amin b'kol shikein. Right, tell us the things you learn it from a even more, even all the more so. Maybe I have it. Inami. He says, now he has another possibility. Hachi kalmar. This is what it means. Olam afilu dechika le sha'ata. What does dechika le sha'ata mean? No, dechika le sha'ata. For him, it is a pressing time, meaning we're talking about a poor person. Right? So 
the key here is you always have to give a third even if you are even if someone is himself poor he has to give now again the Bach like everyone else seems to conflate categories right he seems to follow Tosfa in that sense right not a direct conflation but rather a Kalva Homer right and for him the key is that even a poor person like the Rambam has to give okay how do we learn it from the Ben Amikdash? Analogy, Kalva Chomer, whatever you think it is. Fine. So, so far what we've gotten from here is Tosvot, Marsha, Bach. Is giving to the Ben equivalent to stuck to a poor person? No, it's learned either by analogy or by Kalva Chomer. Right? And the logic basically goes either if it's a Kalva Chomer, if you have to give to the institution at least a third of a shekel, then you must give to a poor person, which is more important or whatever. Again, this is a minimum when no one's asking you for tzedakah. Or for my Rashad's analogy, which is simply, we need a minimum. We found the closest approximation, which is Beit HaMikdash, but not Karbana, which is different, but rather the treasury, which is monetary, that's what you give, right? According to Tosfot, Marsha, Bach, the, folk, the, the uniqueness of poor people remains. For Rabbi Gershom, it seems not to. He seems to fig, conflate them by saying all of this is generically staka. It could be that this is only because he's talking about a case where there's no poor person, right? And therefore, on the virtue thing, you have to give. And once you're giving, and it's not about the people who need, so give a minimum to something just to be a giver. Maybe. I don't know. Okay? Fine. According to all the shita that we've seen so far, does this sugya have anything to do with Masa Shekel? No. This is Alacha in in Saka. In Saka. Okay? What? Of course, I lose my excuse if I if I if they were if they were the only shita. But then again, it's Baba Basra, so I don't need an excuse to do this week. Okay, right now. Um, however, who disagrees? Who thinks that this sugya is in fact related to the sugya Masta Shekel? You get that far? Yeah, who thinks that? Ramban? Who else? Ramban? Who else? What? No, not Ibn Ezra. We'll see. Not Ibn Ezra. Ramban? Who else? Ralbag? And who else? Ridva. So three very big names there think that... No! No, no. This does have to do with Mark So, how do they get to that... How did they get there? So, Nehemia. Let's do the buzz of Nehemia. Nehemia says, The Ben Ezra there says, Why Shlid HaShakel? No Saf al-Machtid HaShakel Atzorach Ha'anyanim Hanish Karim. Right? He's very clear. He's like, even in the context of Ezra, this is separate of the Machtid HaShakel. Right? So, Forget the stucca being about Machta Shekel. Ezra has nothing to do with Machta Shekel. This is different. Don't even, right? Machta Shekel is what you have in number eight. Vaida Ber Adonai Moshe Lemor, Kitisa, Rosh Benechel, Kudayem, and Anuish, Kofer, Nafshol Adonai, Vizkorotam, Lo Yavam, Negev, Vizkorotam, Zayid, Nukol, Avera, Vizkorotam, Machta Shekel, Vashakal, Kodesh, Yisim, Regei, Rosh Shekel, Machta Shekel, Trumal Adonai, etc. But, you know what? We'll look at the Ramban in a second. The Ralbag is much shorter. So let's get the main point of the Ralbag and then we'll look at the Ramban. The Ralbag says Ezra Inflation. It's inflation. Our one third equals their one half. No. Deflation. 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 Yes. 
You're right, deflation. Right, the Ralbag in number nine says, Ra'ui sheteda, she'ashekel azay yoter gadol me'ashekel aniskar batarah. Well, as they, he speak lamb, slisha, a shekel, yot, come on, machsid, a shekel, shetifta, tara. He says it's very simple. There's a certain amount, a half of a biblical shekel, that you use to fulfill your mitzvah, machsa, shekel. The shekel in time of Ezra was bigger, and therefore, a third of Ezra's shekel equals half of that. And therefore, Nehemiah wasn't setting up a new decree. What was he doing? He was enforcing Machsa Shekel and articulating what it looked like in modern dollars. What? Because, appar- because according to the Ralbach, what you say is, and this is what the Ralbach will say, in the time of the Gemara, their Shekels were similar to the shekel in the time of Nehemiah, not the one in the Torah. And therefore, it was a third of the shekel that they were using, which was half of a biblical shekel. Right? Right? So, uh, so, uh, the, so suddenly, now we haven't yet gotten to the tzedakah thing, but the source text for the tzedakah, the third of a shekel that the Gemara uses, i.e. the Pazik Nehemiah, according to the Ral Bag, is just a reiteration of Machsa Shekel. Once you get that, suddenly... Yes, it does. What? Oh, we, we, we'll get there, we'll get there. Okay. But let's, before we get there, let's, let's just establish that the Rambag is not the only person to have said this. The Ramban, look at the Ramban, who is between eight and nine. That always happens. I always forget to number one of them. The Ramban who is numberless and is, uh, because he is, yeah, I don't, I don't know, come up with some reason. What? He's infinite. Yeah, okay. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, okay. So, Rabbeinu Darshu Mikan Shalosh Trumot Miribuya Mikro. He said, first of all, Chazal learned that there are three Trumot that you give to Ben Mikdash every year. V'chein nireh mimash amarakatu madu alo darash lavim lavimi yudam yushalayim, etc. And then he says, Yirem Izek Himasat Moshe Mitzvah Lidorot. First move that the Ramban has to make is, which is not obvious, right? What hurdles, okay, forget Staka for a minute. What hurdles do you have to get through to explain that Nehemiah is just reiterating Machsa Shekel? Hurdle one that the Ramban says is what? You have to assume that the mitzvah machsa shekel was meant to be eternal rather than a one-time fundraiser for the mishkan, right? Right. To say that Nehemiah is reiterating machsa shekel, you have to assume machsa shekel is a mitzvah ludorot, right, forever, and not just a mitzvah, a, a temporary command that Moshe gave to fundraise for the, for the mishkan, right? So that's the first logical move the Ramban makes. And what's his proof? Nehemiah, right? <laughs> he sort of, <laughs> he proves it from Nehemiah, right? His proof is from Nehemiah. I, what's the problem, is Nehemiah doesn't seem to be a proof because it's, you know, a third of a shekel, not a half. So to that he says, He goes to the whole mass for you, right? That it comes, that a third of a shekel ended up equaling Eser Gera, okay? Which used to be a half a shekel. Because Esrim Gera, a shekel, right? In the time of the Torah, a shekel is Esrim Gera. So Machsa shekel is 10 Gera. In the time of Ezra, a shekel was 30 Gera. And therefore, ten, a third of that is still 10 Gera. And really, the mitzvah is to give 10 Gera a year. I know this is very complicated math for you. Okay? It should not be. You're all like looking at me like, what is this arithmetic you think you speak of? Okay? This is very simple. 
A shekel is 20 gera in the time of the, the Torah, so a half a shekel is 10. By the time of Ezra, a shekel is 30 gera, but you still only have to give 10, which is now a third. That's all. Meaning the mitzvah is 10 gera. That's it. That's all you got to know. Right? And therefore, he gets the whole history. Perusho, Kisho, Galum, and Agala, when they came back from the Galut. So he gets to how they did this. Da, 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 da. I don't want to get you all to the point is that a third is still 10 gera. Okay? And second page, when we call Makom, in Adam Rashad, the Chot, really 10, Pachot, Michatsi, Stella, Benachim, Ben Rabim, Ki, Enko, Varnevish, Pachot, Mikay. He says, why? And this is going to be a very important line. Why do you have to get, not give less than this? Why? What does he say? Ein kofer hanefesh pachot mikain. What does that mean? That the Torah says you give machta shekel lichaper al nafshotechem to atone. And what the Torah is telling you is you cannot achieve atonement with less than this amount. Okay? Now, I want you to focus on that for a second. For the Ramban, we're going to come back to this point, but for the Ramban, the nature of this minimum giving, is it about consequences? I mean, sort of is. Is it about the res where the money goes to? No. No. It's about the minimum you need to give to achieve kapara. Now, remember, we said that if you focus on virtue or deontology or the person rather than the person receiving it, then conflating the sources makes more sense, right? You already see evidence of, my, of that claim here in the Ramban because he says, what is his minimum amount? Yaakov's point. Give the poor people however much they need. The answer is, sure, but that's not what this is about. This isn't about the result. This isn't about the consequences. This isn't about the utilitarian part of tzedakah. For that, you have to give whatever somebody asks you. And you, and you have to have a tamchoy and a kupa and all the stuff that we talked about earlier in the year. This should is different. This should is about kapara. It's about you. How much do you have to do give for your sake? To be a giver. To get kapara. That is ten gera. Okay? But we're going to come back to that point in a minute. But for, for the, the first thing that you have to note is that according to the Ramban, how is our sugya related to Mashta Shekel? It is the direct grandchild of it, yes. <laughs> right? Meaning, the Ralbag and the Ramban say, Nehemia is a reiteration of Machta Shekel. So if our Siga then derives Staka from Nehemia, it's essentially deriving Staka from Machta Shekel. Yes? Good. The Malbim also says this in number 10. Omna mitzvah zo nishara kivua lidarot. The mitzvah of Machta Shekel stayed forever. That should be kol shana. Proof, nechemya. I. What about the difference in amount? He says, kiyaz nishtana v'amadbe v'ashlishra shekel, etc. Okay. And bringing it to our sugya, who makes the connection directly to our sugya? The ritva. Because... The Ramban and the Mar Malb and the Ralbag, they make the A equals B between Machsa Shekel and a third of a Shekel. But remember, we're doing very complicated logic here. I know you guys learn logic, so we're going to do a very complicated move here, which is like this. A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. I know this is very hard. Ramban, Ralbag, Marsh, Malbim say that Machsa Shekel A equals Nehemia B. Our Sugya says Nehemia equals Saka, so B equals C. Now the Ridva is going to do the very complicated work of saying A equals C. Right? A equals B, A, right? B, yes, fine. Okay. Well, actually, no, but it's obvious, right? He says, La'olam al Yimna Adam Atam Shlisha Shekel Achol Shana. Well, actually, no. The Ridva is going to do B equals C. And we have to do, I know this is hard. Ramban, Ralbag, Malbim do A equals B. The Ridva now does B equals C. And we now have to 
put together A equals C, okay? I know, I know, this is very hard logic. I, I understand this is very, this is like graduate level logic. No, this is what I did in elementary school. What I did in college and in, in, in logic class is more complicated. But uh, in graduate school, you know, <coughs> yes, this is how I this is how I practice mayor on geometry is Kilayim and Sukkah, you know, it's like this is how the Kilayim and Sukkah were my excuse to teach my, you know, seven year old geometry and squares and square roots and things like that, right, was, you know, this is how, you know, what, exactly. You know, it's very exciting. So, um, fine. So the Ridva says, the Olam al Yimna Adam Ashmo Mishlishit Ashekha Bachal Shana, Perish Le Olam, forever. And now he tells you, the Afilu Leka Aniyim Batre. And he makes it very clear that this is about you giving rather than them receiving, because he says, what this is teaching you is, even if there are no poor people around in your city, I mean, no one to ask you for money, Jacob's question, meaning, find a poor person. Find them somewhere. Seek them out. You know, it, it, this reminds me of the very bad brisker joke, right? Like, they, they joke about briskers that they're like Machbed on Matana Lev Yonim to only give to an evyon. And in halacha, an evyon is like absolute destitution, which is more poor than an ani, right? But they joke about the two briskers who are like running after the evyon and then, you know, fighting over it because they don't want the other one to get there first because once one gives him his matan levyon, he's not destitute, so he'll only be an ani, right? So they all need to find the person, the first person in the day before anyone else gave him, right? But the point is here, you have to... As a Salavajic, Yosef is laughing. He's like, I can so see that happening. I'm, ma I'm so machimir matan levyonim that I don't want anyone else to help him. I want you to stay unhelped until I find you. You're not that heartless. But, you know, this is when, you know, this is where Lundis could get really scary. <clears throat> and then, no, I'm sorry, he does do A equals B, B equals C. And he says, V'hu keneged chati hashekel. This is the Mafsin Ashekel. Ela show Sifu al Amidot. But they add it, but, but deflation, right? Deflation. So A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. So now. Ksuba, we, 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 that's why we say. If you ever notice, we don't say, we don't use biblical shekel. We use, right, the ksuba should be 50 shekel, which we do as, we do matayim skukim kesef. Exactly, right? Is we, what? Exactly, is we figure out the other amount. Or in Israel, so in Israel, it's more common that you'll actually hear people saying, Right, actual like amounts that you recognize. So like you'll go to a wedding, especially Sephardi weddings here, and they'll be matayim skukim kesef vahosiv min delay. Right, he added from his own. Right, because like in America they'll just throw out numbers that mean nothing to you. Right, hosiv min delay. Oh man, skukim kesef. Okay, what what? Saga kol matayim matayim skukim kesef saruf. That's what you'll say. I know you all know what that means. In Israel, sometimes you'll hear something you. Recognized, which is Hosef min delay od million shekel shekalim chadashim. Right? You're like, oh, I know what a million shekel means. I know what that number is. Right? Yes. What? Yes. Yes. They sometimes they will do that. Yes. Not in America. In America, it's like they use numbers that nobody knows what they mean. Oh, Hosef may min delay. No one. You get up there, the person is running through Aramaic, he doesn't know how to pronounce it, and he's slurring words, right? Like, look, there's this thing, if you notice, there's like the few admittedly stuck up people, I'm one of those, sitting in the audience, who are just listening. Is the person reading the Ksuba a Tamil Chacham? 
I can tell by how well or how badly they read it, right? And whether the sentences that they are making up by how they punctuate are nonsense or not, right? So like, and there's always a few of them. So like, I've read Aksuba, I think, once at a wedding, but there was that person, there, there's one or two people afterwards who thanked me for reading it because they, uh, they realized I understood it. But like, I'll go to weddings and I will like be like, I will get like sick because the person will be the host of Mindy Lang, period. And then you're like, do you have any idea, right? Right? Or like, I was once somewhere where he said, Vafilu. End of sentence. Me gleam on the house got fly. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, clearly you have no idea what the words coming out of your mouth are, right? And then there are the places where people, like, really understand what they're doing and, like, have a whole minute of how they say it. So, like, if you ever go, when I was at, I think it was a Victor Rosenzweig's wedding, probably also at Itamar's, his grandfather, right, Eliach, his minog, he has, he leans the ksuba to, I think, Megillus Esther Trump, or Shirim Trump, maybe. I forget which one it was, right? And, like, so it, it's very, I mean, it's an interesting minog, but he clearly knows exactly what he is saying, right? And it, you know. Um, what? Can you write your own suba? Yeah, go ahead, write your own suba. But if you make a mistake, the, the, the Masada tradition will shred it and pull out the printed one from the internet and use that. I'm just telling you that because the first advice any competent rabbi gets, right, Willig, is like, bring 10 subas. If there's a mistake, you want a backup. If there's a mistake on that one, you want another backup. Just print them out, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So the Ridva equates it. Now, the, the, the Ramban already hints at you that what is the logic, right? The logic seems to be, right? What's the logic to equate them? The Ramban is pretty explicit about this. So what's the logic to equate them? It's not about who you give it to. It's about you giving. And what you focus on you giving so then you can say, look, there is, there, we can talk about who you give to, and maybe there isn't as much a distinction. Okay? Let's stop there for today. Tomorrow, listen, guys, tomorrow what you'll see is that there are a few nafkaminas to this question, or nafkaminas to this question. So among them are, if you don't think, if you think that the source is machzana shekel, so then we know you got machzana shekel. If the source is not machzana shekel, so then you've got to figure out then why a shlish of a shekel. If a shlish of a shekel is not machzana shekel, so then where do we get the number, right? That's one question you have to answer. Is if you right. The second question you got to that you you have to figure out is as we've already started talking about is the logic to it, right? Is what is the logic of this, and why is why is this true? Um, uh, I mean, we we can try. The, the um, so, but the, the questions I want the questions I still want to figure out. Okay, is okay. What does this tell us about the nature of suck? And we've already seen that basically the Ramban answered the question is that he thinks that whatever we learn from Machta Shekel, it's not about where it goes; it's about where it comes from. It's the to give it. But I want you to realize that this, and this is, right, the Ramban, by conflating our sugyas, also tells you something very important, which is, what he says is not obvious, not in our sugya, but also not in the sugya of Machtar Shekel. Because if you ask most people, why do you give Machtar Shekel, they would say, because the base of Mikdash needs funds. But if that's the case, then you couldn't derive it to other needs. The Ramban says, ah, I can equate this with Saka, why? Because it's not about where it goes, it's about who gives it. But that shatters what I think most people think Machzad shekel is. Why does the Ramban think this? Because what part of the Pasuk does he focus on? L'chaper al nafshotechem. But if you think that Machzad shekel is not about you, but is about the Beit HaMikdash, then you've got to answer the Ramban's question, which is, but if that's true, why does the Torah seem to support the Ramban by making this about kapara for you rather than about where the money goes? 
that's going to be Machloket Rashi. And we'll see. Rashi Tartamima. The Rushalmi is going to be relevant. So I want to use this figure both to understand this Chiyuv in Staka, and then I want to turn, well, what does it teach us about Machzad HaShekel, right? We'll either finish this on Tuesday or Wednesday, right? Tomorrow you guys get off from Morning Seder because of Super Bowl. Because tonight, you have Mishmar tonight. Mishmar, Super Bowl, Vasikin, Morning Seder off, Afternoon Seder. That's not my problem, but, but right? Fine. Uh, okay, guys.